Okay, so hey everyone and welcome back to another episode of Default Global. This is where we connect with global first entrepreneurs and remote work experts from all around the world. Our guest today is Mike Adams, co-founder and CEO at Grain. Mike, thanks for joining us today. Yeah, great to be here. Yeah, absolutely. So Mike, you have done something new and exciting in remote work and global team building stuff. So you have created a platform that is called Grain that turns video calls into shared knowledge kind of, right? So uh, can you start by telling us about how you got started in this field and what experiences you experiences made what experience made you want, you know, to change the way people communicate in the global workspace? Yeah, sure. So uh, Grain started about four years ago, um, almost five, actually. Uh, I had a, my last company was an online school. And so that really kind of story started in 2014 when we had a training program in San Francisco to teach people to code. It became kind of the whole coding boot camp phenomenon, but we were, you know, the first one of the first two schools to do it. And we decided to try to see if we could do it fully online. And um, Zoom was the only platform that could really support us and, and, and work. And so then I started this uh, company called Mission U in 2016. And the first thing, first hire we made was uh, an, an engineer to build a video meeting management platform because there was nothing that could make it so that our students could access to their lectures and our team could get access to our meetings and not vice versa and and, and using our admissions interviews. Um, because I had learned from that previous experience that when you have conversations that are digital, they're, they have the opportunity to become data in a way that analog in-person conversations just can't. And so um, that was kind of the, I would say, foundation view of, of as conversations move into this digital realm, they can become useful. And um, COVID accelerated that in 2020. There's no doubt about that. And uh, I would say, while some meetings are going back in person, you know, Grain is a remote first company. Um, we're actually still fully remote, but I do imagine at some point we will we will have uh, some sort of co-location amongst a small group of people. Um, I travel on a weekly basis to uh, almost weekly basis to to where uh, my business partner is, and because um, I really do value that in person. But every engineer that we have is is remote. Um, you know, our we just hired a new marketer, and and he's in Spain, and um, everybody is uh, kind of all over, and has all and has been so since twenty eighteen. So. 2018, we we were fully in person, and then we started to hire, you know, engineers in uh, Mexico and in Ukraine and in um, Nigeria. We now have several engineers in, in, in uh, African countries, and it's been great for us. So um, that's kind of been this awesome mix of building a product that enables remote work while also being a remote team. Um, but you know, the thing that's been interesting about the remote is just what everybody says is that it fundamentally comes down to talent and being able to work the best people regardless of where they live has been, I would say, our primary motivator. That's awesome. Uh, so like you, like you mentioned uh, that Grain currently has teams in various countries, uh, in even different countries. I know that you have guys in Nigeria, right? India, Mexico, like you mentioned, Ukraine, right? Mm -hmm. But initially as a CEO of Global First Company, what was your initial motivation to start hiring abroad? Is it related to, you know, cutting your cost uh, or there are something else? Yeah, I mean, there's definitely when you're a founder and you're, running off of you know very little seed funding um you've got to find the best roi for every dollar and it's hard to justify domestic dollars against global dollars is a good way to put it um especially when you can find the talent and so our first uh you know non-us hire was in mexico and he turned out to be awesome he's still with us four years later so um and mike what criteria do you consider when hiring globally, right? Do you have any specific checklist for the for the regions, countries from, from which you are hiring? Yeah, I mean, definitely as we've hired in different locations, we 
been a good place for those folks to work and they like working with us and they know other talented people that live near them in their community. And then, you know, a large amount of our team has been growing through referrals. Um, and so, you know, our last two hires, one in Nigeria and the other one in uh, Poland, mm -hmm. uh, both engineers in the last month, um, came through the existing network of folks who already work at Grain. And so that definitely helps to uh, accelerate hiring and um, I would say increase the, the hit rate because they're coming from a trusted network. Got it. But still, do you have any kind of criteria for a specific region or country or you don't really care? You're just looking for the best fit candidates and that's that's the only thing that you you're looking for yeah totally sorry to answer your question directly the uh no we don't really i'd say we have one marketer in india and we found that he works pretty good hours for pacific time us to overlap okay. but not everyone Crazy. does and so yeah i found it's pretty actually normal for teens in india to work you know overlapping hours with the us um mm -hmm. But that has, I would say, been our main criteria is a willingness to overlap at least four hours with West Coast specific time. Mm -hmm. um, got it, got it. Okay. And uh, the one area that has been really difficult to like find those overlapping times has been um, Australia, probably even more so than India. Um, and uh, we haven't really hired anybody in Japan, um, but uh, I would say India is as far east as we've gone. and. And that one is unique, you know, in, in the hours that he works. But we found the eight hour difference between, you know, Pacific time zone US and um, kind of GMT works to be pretty great. And there's a lot of overlap there and they tend to work later hours um, to overlap with Pacific time zone. And we're still overlapping till about, you know, noon to 1 p.m., you know, my time. And uh, most of the time I want that afternoon time to be fully heads down to work anyway. Okay, cool. Um, and um, just a quick question in terms of, um, have you noticed any differences in the hiring process, you know, between the, for example, the US and countries like Mexico or India, or you mentioned you also have guys in Ukraine? Have you noticed any differences? Yeah, there's a couple countries um, that are, uh, so we've, we've used Deal from the the beginning let's deal.com and alex and, and the founding team there are awesome and so we've been customers of them for over four years and they're brand new and they've definitely improved a lot on the platform and 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 they've made it really easy from the beginning um to hire remotely the areas the countries where i've i found it to be a little bit more challenging um and they're just different than us hiring law and we want to make sure that we're you know in line with you know the laws of local jurisdictions is um the uk tends to be a little bit more difficult and same um with sweden um and there's you know a couple other countries like that where um you can't really set it up with the contractor model you have to go through an employer of record model um and that comes with a lot of extra fees and and kind of uh red tape and challenges and and we do have an, a longstanding engineer, um, you know, that has been on that model and it's and it's been great. Um, but we've also, you know, taken a, 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 a risk on a, I would say, non-engineering hire in one of those markets. And, and that one turned out to be, you know, a, a lot more of a challenge because af right after the uh, kind of probationary period was when it you know, be really, became really clear that it wasn't working out. And we, we just weren't super familiar with the difference in, in those local laws. And um, and that was, I would say, definitely an eye-opening experience about how not all markets are the same in terms of their labor laws. And so I think it is really important to like understand how you can um, make sure that you're being compliant with the different countries and the labor laws there and the implications that that has on the business. Okay, that's cool. So uh, as far as understood, you mostly work with uh, contractors. I mean, you, you hire those 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 guys as, as contractors. Uh, is that right? Yeah, that's correct. Mm -hmm. Cool. That's great. Um, okay, so, uh, you, you know, I'm, I'm just curious to hear your, your vision of uh, the future of global hiring. And uh, as someone who's running a global first talent acquisition company, I have, I, you know, I see some insights into this, you know, 
global hiring landscape. And for example, a year ago, uh, the biggest motivation uh, for my clients to go global was this talent shortage, uh, talent shortage issue in the U.S. However, this year it is budget constraints. You know, that's number one. Mm-hmm. That's our driving companies to, to, to cut their costs. And for that reason, they're just trying to, to find solutions and they go to Mexico, Brazil, Argentina, Europe, and they're looking for talent there. So as someone who, who, who who's, you know, who's also running a global first company and uh, who probably works with, with many remote, remote first companies, I'm curious if you also see the, the same trend of hiring globally. Or do you see some other reasons why companies are still hiring from all over the world? Yeah, I mean, it's a really, that's a great question. So and it's causing me to even think about um, kind of the, the longitudinal analysis of how it's worked for us over, you know, a four year period of time and how it's changed mm-hmm. from 2018 to, to now. Um, I guess really 2019 is when we started hiring globally. Um, is that originally the i would say cost differential between hiring you know internationally and hiring in the states was dramatic um as global hiring became i would say uh kind of mainstream and and the talent shortage got crazy the rates went crazy too because a lot of us based companies that are raising large amounts of money or, or europe you know based that are raising lots of money are um they're competing for that same talent again, just like they're competing for the um, the domestic talent. And it used to not necessarily be that way. Like as a, re- as a remote global first company, um, there, there tended to not be as much competition as an employer. And so 2020, 2021, 2022, that, that really increased. And therefore the, I would say the rates um, and, and, the, and the difference between a domestic hire and an international hire massively mm-hmm. shrunk in terms of the um the roi savings of, of of the same talent for um a different cost and that is uh i would say here to probably to stay as the um benefits of, of hiring globally have become more normalized um i do expect there'll probably be a bit of a of, of a diff, of a shrinking because there are some folks i know that we're in we had engineers we offered in Argentina and Brazil that were asking the exact same rates that we had in the U S and to me, that just didn't make any sense. And they were asking because they had gotten it and you know, that's what their current employer was paying them, but their employer laid them off. And so I do think that there is going to be a bit of a, um, I would say kind of norm normalization that won't be where it was before, but probably won't be as high as it was at the peak. You know, and, and a lot for us around our continued hiring, you know, internationally, even though, yeah, it's, it's not the same that it used to be in terms of, um, of rates, is that it, it's coming from within our network. And, you know, we know these folks and, um, and they know people that are in the team. And so there's a lot of momentum that carries over on this just kind of being how our team operates, more so than the primary motivator being to, like, save costs or like it, like it kind of was the beginning. So it still definitely does save relative to domestic hires, but it definitely isn't what it used to be due to kind of the uh, changes of the last few years. Okay, got it, got it. Yeah, thanks, thanks a lot for that insight. And as we started talking about the money, right? So uh, I know that you raised sixteen mil in round A for for grain, right? Which is impressive. And thanks. what advice would you have for entrepreneurs looking to raise investment for maybe their global first companies, in, in particularly in these challenging times? Do you have any tips or advice? Yeah. Um... I fully recognize the benefit and privilege that comes with raising large amounts of money. Um, that was, I would say, easier to do with Grain because I am a third-time founder, and you know, there's people in my network that I had met that I went back to to want to work with again to raise money. The thing I've seen though is that the amount of money raised tends to be probably praised more than it needs to be or, or deserves. Uh, the best companies tend to be just efficient. They tend to um, make do with what they have. Um, and frankly, investment is best served as an accelerator of something that's working 
more so than a uh, enabler to get something to work. And in the 20, 20, 2019 to 2022 kind of fundraising environment, there's we we have more competitors than I ever thought possible, largely because there's so much more money to be raised. But that money does rate, you know, run out. And we've seen, you know, for every competitor we've seen pop up, basically taking our exact, you know, approach, uh, we've seen most of them have, have run out of money since. And so um, I would say the the amount of money raised is, is uh, oftentimes the wrong signal to be like striving towards. And it's more about like that core business and, and and if you have a really strong core business that has a high growth rate, then you're probably going to be able to raise money for the right reasons to be able to use it to accelerate growth um, because the corporate governance and, and constraints that come with raising large amounts of money, and the raising, raising money is a means to an end. And I think oftentimes, especially, you know, first time entrepreneurs will kind of glorify the money because it does matter. It enables you to hire a team and to, you know, pursue an ambition, but um, venture should be thought of as a way of accelerating something that is really working to win a market um, and to dominate a market more so than as a way of kind of getting a business off the ground. I think most of the time entrepreneurs are better off either kind of bootstrapping or cash flowing things um, and then accelerating it once um, it's very clear what that acceleration path looks like. Got it. Got it. Okay. Cool. And so, um, probably there are about 10 K tech talents who are listening to this podcast right, right now. Uh, and for the, there are a bunch of those guys that are looking for new opportunities. Uh, and many of them are based outside of the US, like in Latam, in Europe. So, uh, if, if you're a highly skilled engineer, for example, living outside of the US and interested in joining a global first company like grain what advice would you would you offer to those to those guys yeah i would say um two things one is use your network like network locally to develop relationships that are connected globally because that is probably one of the best ways to be able to both identify what the market is and be able to move into it if you're not there already. Um, because uh, firms that are hiring internationally are more likely to trust a hire that's coming through their network that they know, you know has been vetted. Um, and then two would be to follow the, um, I would say, people who are talking about remote work and the companies that are promoting remote work um, because those are the ones that tend to be hiring. And so there's been this kind of like upheaval recently to where, you know, return to office, return to office, return to office. And I'm actually, you know, in support of that um, to an extent because, you know, we went from being intentionally remote first to being fully remote. And I would like to go back to being remote first. And the difference there, for those that aren't familiar, is that um, remote first would recognize that there is a nexus of, of, of power and influence that tends to be in person. Maybe it's not every day, but it's co-located. But as far as the communication standards go, um, it is recognized that uh, the remote team has to be uh, a first class citizen in terms of the communication standards and protocols. And so prioritizing asynchronous first communication um, you know, when we had an in-person office, uh, we would always make sure that, uh, every meeting was recorded and, um, that when we are on zoom, that there's a great microphone and that everybody in the room can be seen and heard, um, so that there isn't a degraded, um, or I guess say you'd say you'd be minimizing the degraded experience as a remote participant. And so, um, just paying attention to what companies are, you know, thinking about remote work and, and innovating on it. Um, I would say the first wave have obviously been like the Git labs and the Zapiers um, and the buffers and others. Um, but in 2023, you know, that, that list has grown to, you know, hundreds and thousands of companies. And so um, that's probably the, one of the main things I would do is like work my network locally to enter globally. And then, um, you know, really pay attention to who's who's talking about, you know, remote work in the space. 
yeah that that's a great advice and uh lastly uh mike with the, with the current shift um with the current shift in the global economy and work culture i suppose what do you believe are the key challenges and opportunities maybe for global first companies like like grain uh, maybe in the, like a two year perspective um do you have any kind of prediction yeah i mean that's a really good question to think and look out two years um You know, I think that the thing I would like to do with grain and I've always wanted to do, and it's just a matter of like getting critical mass in a certain area is to have remote offices that are international, but people still, you know, largely come in, um, into work, um, in their local market. So I used to work at, um, uh, open table, which is a restaurant booking, uh, company. I was a software engineer over there. It was actually my first software engineering job in, in the Bay. And, um, one of my bosses, my boss, he now is, you know, CTO leader of his company. And I really love the model that they've worked out as they've found, um, in, I can't even remember. It's, uh, it's a Southeast Asian country. I can't remember exactly which country it was. But they found a, a a leader who they trust, who they know, and they've worked well. And then that leader has built a local team that comes in, you know, and 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 uh, they collaborate, you know, I would say uh, effectively multiple days a week. And they've 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 hired locally, even though the company is based, um, you know, in the U.S. And so he's actually the only one still in San Francisco, and the rest are, you know, um, are, are are spread all over. Um, but they have this kind of nexus of an engineering office with 30 engineers that are in, you know, a local geography. And I think that's something that we'll probably see more often. That hasn't been, you know, what grain has done so far, like everybody works from home. Um, but that's one trend I would imagine will start to play off because of the obvious benefits. Because you kind of get in many ways as a come the best of both worlds of, of the in-person collaboration and coordination, you know, that is with and near their local um, leader, that is um, their, their team lead. Um, and then, you know, obviously the the, the cost savings that, that come from that relative to building the same thing, you know, in person, um, it can overcome some of the time zone challenges with that as well. So I'm going to think of a second trend I'd expect if we're 2025, what would I expect in remote work? Um, I think it's just going to be increasingly more polarized because this wasn't really even a topic and except for on the fringe of talking about hiring remotely and remote first now, because everybody was forced to go remote for like two years, it, there's strong polarization to, to teams and companies either hate it, teams that love it and embrace it. And, and I think that that polarization is strongest in the early stages of a small company And they tend to prefer in person the smaller the company is. Okay, cool. Um, awesome. Yeah, I, I guess I guess very good. Uh, so um, thanks a lot, Mike, for for sharing your insights on international hiring and fundraising yeah, and all me. those challenges and obstacles of global hiring. And yeah, we wish you and and Grain all the best in your journey. Thanks, thanks for joining us today. I appreciate it. Thanks. Have a great day.